This is Military Matters. I'm Rod Rodriguez. This is our final ICYMI, or in case you missed it. Next week, we are kicking off our fifth season of Military Matters, and we are starting off by talking about Putin, Russia, and the Ukraine. So make sure you're subscribed to this podcast so you don't miss our season premiere. But for this, our final ICYMI, we're going back to our coverage last year of the fall of Afghanistan. This episode was a fast take, but as you've probably realized by now, we use the word fast pretty liberally. This episode ended up being as long as our regular episodes, but it didn't feel right to try and shorten it for the sake of time. Our guest Daniel spoke on the condition of anonymity because he no doubt would face reprisal for talking about what he saw from the Kabul embassy and for providing his professional opinion. An opinion rooted in decades of service as a special forces soldier and intelligence professional. We bounced back and forth about how to present this story. It's a first-hand account of the fall of Afghanistan. And when we did this interview, this was only a week removed from Daniel being there at that time. This is his view of a country returning to the rule of the Taliban. From somebody who fought alongside the very people he saw now trying to flee the country for their lives. My only issue with this story is that we had to disguise Daniel's voice. So it can be a little tough to listen to if you're not wearing headphones. But I promise, I promise you, This episode is worth turning up the volume in your car for. If you have feedback for this episode, a story idea, or have something to share with us, shoot us an email to militarymatters at stripes.com. And be sure to leave us a review on Apple Podcast. We really do appreciate your feedback, and we read your reviews, even the bad ones. So on behalf of Jack Murphy, the folks at Stars and Stripes, and of course myself, thank you for listening and supporting this podcast. We are truly honored that so many of you have entrusted us with your time and attention. It means a lot to us, and we're looking forward to bringing you Season 5 next week. But for now, our fast take, Kabul Embassy, the Taliban, and the fall of Afghanistan. Before we begin this fast take, I want to acknowledge the recent tragic deaths of our service members in Afghanistan. It was a complete gut punch to everyone here at Military Matters, and we're releasing this episode with a heavy heart. The interview you're about to hear was recorded a few days before the attack that claimed the lives of 13 service members. At the time of this interview, we'd all been watching Afghanistan fall to the Taliban, quickly and brutally. Images of Afghans falling from the bottom of C-17s as they tried desperately to hold on to the exterior of the planes flashed across our news feeds, while officials for the most part remained silent. We knew almost nothing about what was happening, apart from the desperation in the eyes of Afghans as they flooded into the Kabul airport, and the Taliban quickly seized control of everything in sight, including our embassy. Our guest, Daniel, is a former Special Forces service member and intelligence professional who had been working in Afghanistan and was recently evacuated from the Kabul embassy only a day before this interview. He shares with us his insight into why Afghanistan fell the way it did, the chaos at the embassy, and what he thinks will happen next. For reasons that will become clear in this interview, Daniel requested his name and voice be changed for his safety and to avoid retribution. In light of the recent attacks that claimed more American lives, this insight is perhaps even more relevant now. So let's start with, uh, how would you describe what you do? I still work for Uncle Sam, as you know. Um, You know, work behind the fence. Uh, You're a You just got back from theater. Can you tell me a little bit about, not necessarily exactly where you were, but uh, can you tell me about some of the areas that you were uh, working? I was at the actual embassy. Uh, We were basically living at uh, the old Resolute Support, which is completely uh, crazy because over at uh, RS headquarters is where we were at. And it was weird because last time I was there, which was a few years ago, man, that place was packed. I mean, I, I must have seen 
close about 2,000 French, German, British. I mean, the place was, it was packed. And then when I was there literally a week ago, it was a ghost town, man. It was literally a ghost town. Um, and it was funny because, I mean, uh, you still had the merchants, you know, selling the little, the coffee cups and all the other stuff. And, and they still had that good face. And, uh, you know, they're trying to still make a living. And, you know, they're like, oh, one of the Americans coming back. And, you know, you don't want to be basically tell them, it's like, sorry, man, there's no one coming back, dude. And, uh, it, it, and it sucks because you see all that and just, it, it's all going to, all going to hell. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we basically were working with uh, the Afghan government with their exploitation, you know, needs of uh, going after, you know, ISIS-K personalities and stuff like that, Taliban and Al-Qaeda. As we started getting closer to the withdrawal, um, what was your observations of the Afghan army, the Afghan government? Uh, did you notice, uh, did you, did you, see a noticeable wind down on their end, maybe disinterest. What, what was their, what was their impression to you? Well, dude, for the actual guys on the ground, like, you know, we were both in the military before. I mean, from like, I would say the, uh, the Lieutenant down, it was business as usual. They didn't know anything. And then literally it was, uh, like two weeks ago, uh, it was like a Thursday. Uh, we get a phone call from one of our guys and it was like, Hey man, our general just left. Literally, he just left, got on a plane and left. So I guess I'm in charge now. Uh, and we're like, oh, okay, well, congratulations, man. And he goes, yeah, I just don't know what happened. He just left. And then it would just, it's like they knew, you know, the what was coming down. And it sucked because we kind of were starting to hear it because we had guys down in Kandahar. And we had heard that, um, you know, the, the Afghan Special Forces, Afghan Commandos, they were getting ready to pull up a fight down there in Kenar, and they had the resources uh, to sustain a good fight. But supposedly somebody within Kabul called down to that commander down in uh, Kandahar and basically said, hey man, uh, just uh, don't do anything, you know, just uh, come on home. And then they just basically like, put the Taliban will take Kandahar. And it was literally the last nail in that coffin for, I would say for Afghanistan, because as soon as, we lost Kandahar. It was that was that last momentum that the Taliban needed to basically push forward. And you know, it, the, the Afghan Special Forces, Afghan Commandos. I mean, I trained some of those guys, man. They're, 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 they're some badasses, and um, they were the only ones that have actually been standing up for Afghanistan. And as you've been watching the news, a lot of those guys went up to Panjshir, and they're up there with uh, Shah Massoud's son, basically, kind of like. Uh, creating a new Northern Alliance. And that's like the only, uh, you know, province that the Taliban never took over. And that's where a lot of the Afghan special operations folks with a lot of the military equipment that they were able to, you know, move forward up there has, you know, been uh, reestablishing itself up there. And uh, so who knows if they're going to be able to, uh, you know, put up against the Taliban, but, uh, a lot of those folks just moved up there and waiting to, I guess, reconstitute and, and see what happens in the future. But, you know, sadly enough, yeah, they gave up Kabul pretty fat, you know, pretty easily. Um, another story that I heard uh, down in uh, Camp Moorhead, outside of Kabul, um, they actually had a good gunfight with the Taliban, with the Afghan SF guys, and uh, they actually put up a good fight and they ran out of ammunition. As, as always, those are the stories you hear. These guys just run out of ammunition. And, uh, Luckily, these guys didn't surrender. They just basically just, you know, escaped in the middle of the night and, you know, made their way to uh, in, into the city and then basically just evaporated within the city. So luckily, these guys have been kind of surviving. Um, but, I mean, it's it's out there, man. It's a, it's a sad story, too, because, I, like, I've been there since the invasion, so. We just, uh, last week, uh, we released an episode about Kundas, the 2015 battle for Kundas. We, we were talking with Josh Middleton, uh, another SF Delta who was there uh, le helping lead the fight. And he talks about how the commandos, uh, to your point, 
were valiant soldiers. They were fighting. They were doing what they were, what was expected of them. But the ANA uh, was a different animal in and of itself. Uh, you know, he was watching these guys give up. Why the stark difference between the ANA, the Afghan National Army, and their willingness to cower and, and give up versus the commandos who smaller numbers but seem willing to fight? Oh, yeah. Good answer. Good question, bro. Um, and just to give you an example, uh, right before I left, and, you know, don't quote me on the numbers, but um, right before I left, I saw that there was a four-step disposition site. And for Afghanistan, I mean, for Kabul, I think there was like 2,000 Afghan special forces, Afghan commandos. And it was like 120,000 ANA within the city limits of Kabul. And they still freaking surrendered the city. That's that's what baffles me. But to go into your question, man, um, in the last, what, 20 years, if you recall, the folks that actually trained uh, the ANA and don't get me wrong, I have nothing against the National Guard in any state, but it's been the National Guard of various states in our country I have been training the ANA, where <laughs> look at the Afghan commandos, Afghan special forces have been being trained by U.S. Army, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, you know, Marine Recon. So they've been getting trained by the best and showing them that camaraderie and basically that top up driven way of thinking and communicating where a and is like jumping jacks and formations and, and you know, do these, do this. And it, the level of operational thinking was just not transferred to the ANA. And, you know, I, I kind of hate my own brethren because we kind of actually had that ANA mission back in early 2002, but it wasn't the cool thing to do back then in 2002. We wanted to do the storm kicking. And uh, so we gave up that ANA mission. But... It was the true coin uh, piece that we should have followed, um, you know, and we just didn't follow through, man. But, uh, yeah, I think we, as the U.S. government, kind of uh, didn't properly train the ANA. I mean, they were just there showing up, getting a paycheck. You know, yeah, they might go on an operation here and there, but they never did anything. Well, that kind of leads me to my next question. We're, we're looking at two decades of war, and during these two decades... The U.S. Has, has changed a lot of its defense strategies, a lot of its defense policies. I want to take a closer look at the special operations, the special forces, U.S. Army special forces in particular. Uh, their role and their purpose seemed to slowly change over these last 20 years from being a force multiplier to being direct action forces. Uh, do you think that that changing role impacted the Afghan National Army's training? Do you, we could look at special forces and say, well, they're the force multipliers. They should have been at the forefront of training this Afghan National Army, not just commandos, but the, the, the armies themselves to fight the Taliban. Isn't that what special forces does? Go to places, train guerrillas, train armed forces to fight the enemy and institute democratic government? Uh, yes, but unfortunately, back in like about 2004, 2005, when we started standing up the commandos and the Afghan Special Forces, that became now our, you know, we became the cadre to that force. And the regular army, as per se, for the Afghan government, you know, Afghan military, that kind of fell now back onto, you know, our cadres of military units and stuff like that, that were your. You know, I think the original ones were the uh, Asian Airborne, then it was the 10th Mountain, 101st. And then that became, that no longer became the fancy thing for them to do. So then they started giving that mission set to the National Guard units that started to cycle through Afghanistan. So, but, you know, you are correct when it comes to us training that nation's force. But if that nation's force, whatever country we're at, has a special operations entity, that becomes our primary teaching you know, goal. But my idea is that the the A and A grew too big too fast and they were basically put out all over the country when they were not ready. I think if we would have kept it smaller, uh, took a little bit more time, instead of basically trying to outfit so many uh Afghans, 
you know, it's like, okay, well now we have a core, you know, okay, now we have two cores. And I was like, yeah, but are those two cores going to actually fight? You know, where if you would have actually concentrated more time, because I mean, from my, I'll give you an example, man. We're trying to teach these guys troop leading procedures, how to do linear and ambushes, um, how to do raids and all this stuff. But these guys don't even know how to read. So how can you or understand basic information and you try to teach them, you know, advanced levels of uh, combat operations? It, it's it, it's not you needed to teach these guys. You, have to, you needed to teach a generation basically how to be. Uh, proficient and basic skills before you even try to teach them soldiering skills. But you literally basically got uh, dirt farmers. And like, again, there's nothing wrong with that. If you, if they had the heart to fight for the country, but unfortunately, Afghanistan is so uh, tribal that there was no, you know, I am a nationalist. I want Afghanistan. They were more about their tribe than anything else. There was no national identity as an Afghan. Exactly, where it would be like, yeah, I'm a, I might be a farmer, I might be a plumber, but I'm going to stand up and fight for my country, like the way we would do here in our country. There was none of that. It was just like, hey, I'm here to get, you know, get a paycheck because it's better to me work for, you know, the Afghan government as a soldier than to basically, you know, be picking pop fields or whatever the heck, you know, they would be doing. I think that's interesting. That's a that's a very strange and alien concept for a lot of Americans who were born a United States. I think a lot of people forget that USA is an acronym, the United States of America, that we we identify as a Californian, as a Texan, as a Floridan, as a Virginian. But you also identify as an American. And this is a very strange concept for countries like Afghanistan, where you identify with your family's name. You identify with your family, then your tribe, then your region. And and often that's as far as it goes. Like, that's it. Oh, yeah. Even something as simple as like trying to explain to them like world history. Like back when I was in Kunar province, I actually, uh, you know, we're deep into the, the hills up there. And we ran into some folks and, and I actually asked them, what do you know about the United States? What, what's your idea of the United States? And oh my God, the story that I heard was this, um, that the Roman Empire never collapsed. That when the Romans just crossed the Atlantic and, and started the United States, that we are descendants of the Roman Empire. And I'm like, what? And they're like, yes. And then I'm like, you know, we're only like a little bit over 200 years old, right? And they're like, that's a straight lie. How is it that the most powerful nation on the planet is only 200 plus years old? He goes, no, you guys are the descendants of the Roman Empire. And I'm like, yeah, no, Hoss, that's, that's not true. And that's what a lot of these people would tell me in various regions, that we're basically the defendants of previous civilizations, that we're not the beginnings of a rebellious group of people that started their own nation. They don't believe that. As we saw the drawdown happening, my understanding is that Intel analysts had informed the president and Joint Chiefs of Staff that the ANA and the government could sustain itself for at least six months, that we had time that once we drew down, there would be some fighting with the Taliban that we could possibly start supporting the Afghan government with airstrikes, that it would, that we would, it seemed very, uh, they painted a picture of a, of a, a slow, gradual fight. But what we saw was we left and two weeks later, it was over, like game over within a week. The entire thing was done. The Taliban comes in, gains control, takes all of the ANA's guns and trucks and weapons, and now they are more equipped, more armed than ever before. Did you hear about this original intelligence assessment? And if so, what were your thoughts on it when you heard it? Well, dude, I actually was hearing the opposite, man. I was actually hearing an intelligence report say that they was being briefed up to the highest level that they're like, hey, um, if we do not continue to militarily support with airstrikes, they're going to collapse, you know? They didn't, I didn't hear no six months. I heard weeks. 
to what I heard. I think the, the longest projection I had read was a month. If we did not continue to provide them air support, which we did not, but unfortunately they weren't able to support themselves because if you recall uh, a couple of months ago, the Taliban had infiltrated into the city and they were, ta they were targeting all the Afghan pilots. So they were actually executing Afghan pilots. So they actually knew that if the Americans were not providing them air support, then the Afghan government does have that capability with those Afghan pilots, the Afghan Air Force. But if there was no pilots around because they've been executing a lot of the pilots, then there goes that air asset support. And again, going back to that ANA, they, all they know for the last 20 years is like, hey, when we get in a fight, the Americans send helicopters, the Americans send planes. Well, when that never started coming, they're like, well, dude, we're literally on our own. And they're like, yeah, I'm not gonna die for this. I'm not gonna die for government. Especially a lot of those guys are from that particular village that they belong in. They're like, hey, I could just uh, take off this uniform, come back tomorrow, and now I'm telling that. Did you see a lot of that? Did you see a lot of folks just, you know, switching sides? I did not, but I did hear. Yeah, I hear down in the South, especially in the South. Not so much in the North, but in the South, it was just, you know, one day they got a uniform, the next day, you know, they don't have a uniform. We hear a lot of reports of Taliban uh, dragging people out in the streets and shooting them, executing them in the street, uh, people that they felt were working with Americans. How in danger, what, what is the, the, the real danger right now for folks who have been identified as having worked with the U.S.? Well, it's not just that. All right, let me give you more of a picture. So I have a guy right now that I'm currently trying to get out. Uh, he's been a, a trusted asset for many years. Um, and I've, we've trained him well, where he's basically moving from one house to another house every night, never staying in the same place twice. Um, he started recording, uh, and he lived in a nice neighborhood, you know, not a terrible neighborhood, but enough where he was like, you know what, I have a gate in my house I'm probably going to be identified as probably somebody with wealth. And that's what the Taliban was targeting because they assumed a, anybody with wealth probably was either a working for the Americans or B working for the Afghan government. So those were the first that folks that got targeted. Now, uh, I did see some videos. I did see some pictures, um, of, you know, people being, uh, pulled out of their houses and basically the Taliban, the Taliban is acting just like the Gestapo was you know, going after the, uh, the Jews. They were basically just pulling people out on the streets, doesn't tell them whatever night, executing them, women, you know, women and children as well, and they just moved into that house. And it's it's sad because a lot of that stuff, of course, is not making it to the media. And, uh, and I know that if it did, it would basically destroy any uh, report that's going out there. But it's, it, yeah, it's happening. And um, it's just, uh, you know, it's a pretty bad situation that some guys have to deal with it. And there's, you know, like my guy, he's an SIV, but and he's been in the system for seven years trying to still get his SIV and uh, nothing. And uh, it just, you know, yeah, it's going on, man. And uh, I heard it was, it was going on a, a lot in, uh, in Kandahar more, uh, but a lot of those reports kind of started dying down with a lot of the people started, you know, going away. We're, we're hearing reports right now of increased flights out of Kabul. Uh, the, the, the urgency now is trying to evacuate Americans out of Afghanistan. I'm just curious, who are these Americans? Why are there so why are there like 10,000 Americans in Afghanistan? Uh, it doesn't seem like that's a place where Americans would have been going. I was very surprised oh, to hear brother. that number. You'd be surprised, man. All right, so let me throw some numbers at you. So you've heard of NGOs. You got Doctors Without Borders. You have the Peace Corps. You got all of these, you no know, disrespect, but tree hugging folks that want to, um, you know, do good for people. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but they're they're out there, and they still feel like one story that I just read. There was a actual doctor, American doctor without borders, that was in one of the hospitals in Kabul. And he literally was told by the Taliban, he's like, ah, and this was a couple of days ago, uh, you need to leave. He literally was told to leave the hospital because this doctor wanted to still do his, you know, I guess, doctor duty of helping people. 
and they felt they feel more inclined to do what they were there to do than that nationality that they're Americans. Because they, in my assumption is that they assume that we're staying there for the duration. They don't, in my opinion, is that they're not grasping the severity that August 31st is going to come and it's coming really short. And the U.S. mail is going to start evacuating days prior to the 31st. And if they're not out, they're going to be stuck there. There are reports that uh, other countries like France and Germany are actually going into the cities and extracting their people. There is this media portrayal of American policy uh, at the executive level that they are sitting on it, that they are not allowing soldiers and Marines to go into the, to extract or to actually get these people out. Uh, how accurate is that? Oh, extremely accurate, bro. I mean, and man, do you know we have 50, we had 5,800 U.S. troops on the ground. All right. We had more troops on the ground than we did during the invasion. Look at those numbers. We had more troops. We have more troops on the ground right now than we did during the invasion, and we were still able to take Afghanistan in what three three months with less numbers than we currently have on the ground. But yes, the British were out there using you know British SAS was out uh, getting people. The French, yeah, every country is you know you know gone into the city to get their folks. Are there U.S. soft elements going out of the wire? I'm not going to say yes, and I'm not going to say no. But they're not going into deep into the city. But they are going out for little quick snatch and grabs of personnel that it might have told to be at a particular corner at a particular time that no one was around. And they're like, come on, get in. And then they get picked up. And another thing, man, I think it was a mistake, a mistake to give up the embassy. Because when I left the embassy on Sunday, I was like, and dude, our embassy is amazing. I mean, it's like Disneyland, brother. It is amazing embassy. Um, it's a million, it's a billion dollar facility, brother. We literally could have been running operations out of there, gathering more people into the embassy because we could literally park four CH-47s at the uh, soccer field right next to the uh, U.S. Embassy. Park two more helicopters right in the middle of the street there between the embassy and the, uh, uh, the State Department apartments area. Uh, I mean, we could have been basically running operations out of the embassy and basically left the embassy at the last minute. Why didn't we? Well, that's uh, my assumption is that the administration kind of forced the ambassador to basically uh, extract himself out because the embassy is kind of still in play, but they're in play at HKIA, not at the actual U.S. embassy. Because we brought that flag down. I think I want to say it was on Sunday or Monday morning. There is this uh, a, a perception, at least I, I've seen it anyhow, that we were really in a hurry to get out. Dude, if let me tell you how many people we have at the embassy. Just to give you an example, we literally had enough people where we could have put a person on the wall, double our end vote, and still have enough to be relieved for child. The Diplomat Security Service had, uh, don't quote me in the numbers, but close to about 100 armed diplomatic security forces there. There was a company of 10th Mountain there already. Um, and then don't forget, you know, OGA, who had their paramilitary folks there as well. I mean, we had a lot of armed personnel where we could have, and the embassy is a fortress. We could have defended the embassy, worst case scenario. We had enough armored vehicles, enough ammunition. Hell, the, the, we had uh, the, the, uh, the C-RAM guns around the embassy as well. I mean, it, it, it was a mini bunker, and we let that go too as well. They've got guns. They've got all of our equipment. Uh, you're describing a billion dollar, you know, high level facility. It didn't it doesn't strike me that there was enough time to take everything out of there that could possibly be sensitive. Uh, uh, how concerned are you that that these enemy forces, these terrorists are controlling these locations and everything in them? Now, I know 
when we started evacuating the embassy, we were like destroying, you know, servers. Um, I mean, anything that had crypto or anything like that was either hammered or just basically put in a pulverizer. Uh, all classified was, I mean, it was like seeing the, uh, the Argo movie where they're destroying everything. That was the scene I witnessed, man. It was, it was crazy because it was like people running around with freaking stuff to get destroyed and put it in the shredder, pull, put in the pulverizer, you know, guys with big sledgehammers destroying server racks and servers and, you know, us pulling hard drives out of, you know, super computers and, and TS computers, and then it was like, okay, well, those, those are going back to the States, okay? Those can get destroyed. And, and it's just like everybody going floor to floor, destroying, you know, sensitive equipment, sensitive items, where, yeah, some things did fall, fell through, which was the ammunition. I mean, oh my God, if you would have seen the levels of ammunition that was within RS headquarters and the embassy, it, it, it was mind boggling, brother. Um, I mean, and then the armored vehicles. I mean, the diplomatic security service had these amazing freaking mini armored buses that, I mean, and all those, I know for a fact, got left there. Now, a lot of them are like brand new. I mean, it's like an F-450 on on steroids, fully armored. Um, I mean, it's just so much equipment just got left there that I was like, we literally could have run operations from there and stay there to the very end. Were those vehicles being incapacitated? Were they being destroyed? Engine blocks, thermite, anything? Or were they just being I left? did not see any vehicles being destroyed. Um, the, the, I did hear a couple stories where they were pulling, you know, firing pins off of some weapons, stuff like that. A lot of the stuff did get evacuated with said personnel. But I mean, like the embassy liquor store, uh, there was about $250,000 worth of liquor that was still left there at the embassy liquor store. So... Um, I know you like bought a bottle a couple of days before we evacuated, you know, but. Uh, well, they're all they're all hardcore, very religious people. I'm sure they won't touch any of that. Yeah, of course not. Of course not. Or or the indoor pool that's in the basement. I mean, a little stuff like that. I mean, it just. Can you tell me a little bit about your personal feelings uh, and, and maybe some of the vibe from the embassy staff? Was this business as usual? Were, were people staying cool and collective? Was there a sense of fear for your lives? Well, all of a sudden, it's like Saturday morning, I went to the consulate office trying to petition for my guy. And uh, so I'm at the consulate section and I'm I'm trying to talk to um, <clears throat> the consulate folks. And um, right before I entered the building, I noticed that there was a U.S. Embassy staff member talking to a large group of embassy staff personnel. Granted, this is Saturday, a day before the actual NEO. And... Um, this is how clueless these people were, that they were literally asking this lady that was given this brief about what to expect and so they, things to do. And this one person said, hey, well, I was told I can go home on leave. When can I come back to finish my tour? So they were still clueless that no, everyone eventually is going to be evacuated. And this person, these people were talking about, you know, they, they were promised TY leave that, uh, what, what's, you know, are they going to be allowed to come back to their same apartment at the embassy when they came back? I mean, they were literally clueless of what a NEO was consisting of. I mean, they were just like, they thought they were just going to leave and then we we're going to come back. I mean, that's to the level of cluelessness of some of the embassy staff people that I was dealing with. Because even some folks were just like, okay, well, I'll leave here. I'm just going to go to another location. You have left the country, you're back home, you're watching the news. Uh, can you tell me what is it that they're getting wrong? What What is it that the that Americans need to understand about the situation in Afghanistan that they're not hearing? This is, and, and as I've told a lot of people, because people are like, well, why Afghanistan? Who cares about Afghanistan? And I will break it down to you like this. Those last 20 years, we have perfected our craft and intelligence globally, not just the U.S., globally, because of the skill sets that we have mastered in Afghanistan. A lot of the events that could have happened globally, not just in the U.S. and, and uh, England and France or whatever, have 
been diverted because of intelligence that was gathered in Afghanistan. It's a domino effect. A lot of the information that could have led to the arrest of a guy who was talking to another guy, a weapons facilitator who was moving weapons, who was being financed by this guy, that could have harmed globally that information that arrived in Afghanistan. So by us removing that piece of the puzzle in the game board of the world, we are now are going to be left without knowledge of what's going on globally. Because as you are saying is that we're leaving a lot of these areas and we're not gonna be able to have boots on the ground to know what's going on because, you know, God love the CIA, but they're not everywhere. And they don't have that ability to see and hear everything. So things will be falling, you know, off that table. And we're going to have potentially another 9-11. Well, that was going to that, that's actually my, my next question is what you're describing is a world that is worse with us not being there. Do you really feel like there's a threat towards the United States by allowing the Taliban to come back into power? Do you think there there's any chance the Taliban can operate as a legitimate government? Of course not. Of course not. It is impossible for those guys to. I mean, it, it, I will be surprised if, if tomorrow they're like, okay, we're going to have open free elections and we're going to be doing this, but that's not in their nature. And their nature is to be the way the Taliban is. And the Taliban does not think the way we expect a civilized government to occupy its people, to protect its people. Uh, they're ready. And the only reason they're helping us right now is because they want us out as soon as possible so they can start back into their their craziness, you know, go back into their shenanigans. And as soon as we're out of the country, the sooner they can get into their stuff. Um, I'd be surprised if probably in the next couple of days, they don't start shutting down the cell phone towers, maybe shutting down power cells, power grids somewhere in the city to kind of make things a little bit more difficult on us, especially if we start kind of pushing those buttons and we're like, no, we're not, we're not going, we're going to do this. You're going to be like, okay, here, no more power on your, on your cell towers. And now no way to communicate with the folks on the ground. You know, so I, I see the Taliban pushing our buttons and we start pushing theirs, but we kind of have to be more forceful and not let anybody go because unfortunately, like I said, there's going to be Americans that are going to be left behind and we're going to have to go back in there and a lot of American lives might be harmed to try to rescue those Americans out. We saw something similar in Iraq. Uh, we left Iraq for the most part. Uh, ISIS comes in, they take over Mosul, they take over most of the uh, Iraqi cities. We supported part of the Iraqi army, but it seems here there's a huge difference between the Iraqi army and the Afghan army. Do you think there's any chance in, in future administrations that we are going to go back and support Afghan efforts to, to fight the Taliban? Will there be even Afghan efforts to resist the Taliban? I think there would be if we see what develops with uh, Shah Massoud's son up in the north and see what develops off of him. Um, if he's able to uh, kind of gather this forces, maybe gather that, that Afghan spirit, uh, he might be a force we can basically, you know, help out maybe in the, during, these, during this administration. But yeah, I definitely do not see us uh, going back in Afghanistan. I want to thank Daniel for having the courage to do this interview. There's a lot that we discussed that just can't be published publicly, but I will say that there is a difference, a stark one, between policies and policymakers and the efforts and drive of the service members that execute the orders given to them. Our men and women in uniform are professionals of the highest caliber. They are part of the most agile and deadliest military force the earth has ever known, but they are also the most compassionate caring and selfless people that America has to offer. We've seen Marines hoisting babies over concertina wire, soldiers comforting families as they wait to find out if they'll be flown to safety, airmen and sailors working around the clock to exhaustion, providing air, medical and logistical support to helping Afghans and Americans find their way home. Tragically, 13 service members came home early. They gave their lives in the service of others. They are not alone in whatever lies beyond. They are in the company of heroes, 
surrounded by their fellow brothers and sisters who have fallen in defense of the defenseless, who sacrificed everything so that others could experience freedom if only for one day. Our thoughts go out to the grieving families with the knowledge that no speeches, no words, no sentiment can begin to mend the place in their hearts that has been torn from them. Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Darren T. Hoover. Marine Corps Sergeant Johanny Rosario Picardo. Marine Corps Sergeant Nicole L. Gee. Marine Corps Corporal Hunter Lopez. Marine Corps Corporal Dagan W. Page. Marine Corps Corporal Humberto A. Sanchez. Marine Corps Lance Corporal David Espinoza. Marine Corps Lance Corporal Riley McCollum. Marine Corps Lance Corporal Dylan R. Marilla. Marine Corps Lance Corporal Kareem Nikui. Marine Corps Lance Corporal Jared Schmitz. Navy Hospitalman Maxton W. Soviak. And Army Staff Sergeant Ryan C. Noss. Thank you for listening. I'm Rod Rodriguez. This was Military Matters Fast Take.